ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 110 of the MTB podcast, presented and hosted by Worldwide Cyclery and Bean the Cat. My name is Jared. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> and I'm Jeff. And I'm Liam, not Bean the Cat. Jared's cat's not here. He just really wanted to talk about his cat, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> in this episode, we're going to discuss the new Revel Ranger version 2. Our Deviant Claymore, Claymore review video, why longer and slacker isn't always better, plus listener questions ranging from what goes into optimizing bike design, new tires we've been testing and loving, the secondhand bike market, and much, much more. So wow. much more. So without further ado, you're off sound effect duty since you just uh, yeah. talked about your cat, so it's on. You're on sound effect, <laughs> Liam. Right. Wow, that was pretty good. Reasonably so. Oh, reasonably so. <laughs> <laughs> One more slip up from you, buddy. <laughs> One more You're slip out of here. I'm out of here. No more bean mentions off the cup for me. <laughs> uh, recent news in the bicycle industry that's worth discussing, at least things that's uh, happened to us that we care about in our lives. Um, Revel, <laughs> Revel Ranger V2. Uh, I love Revel. Revel's been such, like, literally probably the best brand we've ever worked with to be honest in terms of like people and bikes and the way they see the world and the way they communicate and the way they listen to feedback and it's just really good um obviously when when was adam on episode uh, 108 eight yep. a couple episodes back adam yeah, yeah. the founder of revel was on so if you're curious to learn more about revel bikes listen to that he was all that was the second time he was on the first time he was on he talked a lot more about his founding story and whatnot mm-hmm. i don't remember what episode that was 92 mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Just search it on the a bit Worldwide Cycle yeah. website or scroll back in your podcast queue there. But they, uh, my favorite bike from Revel, which I ride pretty much all the time, is the Ranger 115 mil travel in the back, 120 in the front, 29er. Some might say it's a light trail bike. The word down country gets tossed around, but I don't really care too much for the term XC down country. Plus. XC. I never heard that. But plus is confusing because then people think of plus tires. And oh, it's not yeah. about plus, plus tire size bike. tires on there. <laughs> no plus that, size I'm tires. I'm so glad that fat uh, died. Light trail, short travel, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Short, short travel, full short travel. 29er. Yes. Yeah. To me, it's a general all around fantastic mountain bike. It is a mountain bike. It is a mountain bike. It is a bike you ride in the mountains. Uh, I ride that thing more than any other bike that I've had in the last three years because it just works great especially for where i am most of the time it just works amazing like for how well it climbs and how just fast and efficient that bike is it just descends amazing and yeah i like that so great handling i'm super into that but i was also stoked riding that uh new yeti sb120 which you have right now liam yep that thing was really fun uh even when i went over the bars super hard (laughs) crashing into jared uh (laughs) if you want to see that crash it's in one of these podcasts recent podcasts and recent youtube videos uh, but the Ranger V2, they uh, they changed a couple things here. New rear triangle, some new links too. Yeah, right. Because like, right. they changed all the bearings and the hardware. hardware to connect the bearings, which is that's one of those changes that most people are like what what is, what is that? I don't care. But it's actually pretty meaningful for people who work on the bike a lot, well, it's, and it's like mechanic friendly. It's more yeah, durable, longer it's, lasting. It's much more durable than the uh, first version. Um, It's stiffer because of the way it mounts to the frame, the way the links are designed now to handle the new hardware, as well as bigger and double road bearings. I don't know if that was on every uh, pivot on the V1, but it is now on the V2. Um, So it actually translates to, you know, I think they claim 20% stiffer ride fuel. Mm Mm-hmm. So, but part of that was also the carbon layup. That, is, the rear that is also part of the carbon layup as yeah. well. But in combination, the whole rear end is stiffer with the links in the rear triangle. So One of the things I appreciated about Revel is that they didn't just follow this, everything needs to be stiffer, everything needs yeah. to be stiffer. They actually kind of communicated pretty well. They're like, well, we spent some time optimizing and tuning these bikes to where they're not overly stiff, but also not flexy. Yeah. And I was like, yes. That's what we need Mm -hmm. because there's definitely bikes that have taken it too far and they just chatter your teeth out because they're just so stiff. Um, So there, there is a, there is a level there like everything. Optimized stiffness or optimized flex is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. They did a really good job on that with the gravel bike too, the Rover. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, looks pretty beefy, but it rides pretty smooth based Mm -hmm. on the carbon layup and everything. So Yeah. yeah. Isn't that bike slightly heavier than other gravel competitors though? No, it, not really. It's it, like 17 it might, and change. Which... It might be a little bit, but like 
if you're comparing it to like a an open, which is like a gravel race bike, the Rover is in gravel race bike. It's like a gravel fun bike. Yeah. That's what's so funny about the gravel side is that yeah. you have these mountain bikers who come into gravel and they say, yeah, I want something that is optimized stiffness, that's durable, that's fun to ride. And then you have these roadies that come into it and say, I need something super light. Just with fast. like wider clearance yeah. for tires. And wider clearance because yeah. I'm going to ride it on a fire road. Yeah. So there's like yeah. two totally opposing opinions there. It's yeah. Like three or um, four too, if you want to get in the weeds. But yeah. 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 And then you have Definitely. bikes like that and you specialize that has like the weird seat tube that's like separated from the yeah let's not talk about that yeah well i'm just saying that's like a whole nother rabbit hole like weird yeah. gravel bike stuff yeah yeah it's true that's a weird side of the thing but <laughs> that that new ranger my my biggest you know i rode that v1 so much the biggest thing i noticed obviously on the v2 that was really meaningful to me was chain ring clearance is improved because that new rear triangle which means now there's just absolutely no issues running different size oval chain rings um, and different brands and cranks and whatever. And then uh, the tire clearance, they could have added some more tire clearance on there. I buzz my tire every so often on the side of that thing, and they fix that for the V2. Um, and, oh, it's also UDH now. Oh, and yeah. That, the, oh, V2, yeah. the V2 that I'd been riding had the SRAM transmission on it, and it's just so quiet. Yeah, that whole system like is I'd really never quiet. ridden a Ranger with the transmission on there, and it is just unbelievable how quiet it is. It's just like, wow, this is... It changes the way. Like if you just rode a bike back to back with with that drive train and without, I think the sound and the is the biggest thing you notice. That's nice. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge part of and just, shifting you know. under load, of course, too. But oh, yeah. that you know, that's a big change. But other than that, like just the sound. Like when you're talking about just descending with a like, not, when you're not pedaling your drive train, how yeah. does it perform? That's the quietest drive train I've ever ridden. That's nice. Yeah. So chain slap is annoying, to say the least. Yeah. Yep. It sure is. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't change any geometry of the Ranger V2, which I think is fine. Yeah. Um, I think it's perfect for what it is dedicated for. So, yeah, yeah, totally. I agree. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think that there's schools of thought of different people and their various preferences, and we're going to get into that later in this episode Ooh. because it is an interesting topic of why lower and slacker isn't always better and uh, – or sorry, longer and slacker – longer, slacker, and lower. And lower. Uh, isn't always better, and I and I think that there there is some interesting conversation to be had around that, and just the way that bike brands have to differentiate their whole bike lineup and where it makes sense and doesn't make sense to change head tube angles and reach and all that stuff. Yep. Uh, but we'll jump to that in a minute here. First, we will mention oh yeah, the Revel Ranger V two. We did a YouTube video. If you're curious to watch more about that, check it out. Uh, the YouTube video that you two guys did yeah. was the Deviant Claymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very different bike. This is, very a, this different. is a beefier long travel 29er. Mm -hmm. How Maybe much travel was on that sucker? 165. Yeah. Yeah. 170 mm -hmm. or 180 fork. Yep. Right. Yeah. That was a super fun bike. Um, I had a great time riding that bike and uh, Liam spent what, like at least a month on or or a few weeks on the yeah, Claymore when they sent to probably us. Probably a little over a month. Um, but yeah, I got to ride Zach Way Myers, our, one of our employees out in Reno. Uh, he is a mechanic and customer service representative up there. And he himself has a pretty sweet Claymore um, that if you watched the video, you saw. And he was nice enough to lend it to us. That to, thing is decked out. Yeah. 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 Uh, Zach's a like, phenomenally good rider. So like he knows how to build his bike and deck him out nice. He's sick. And, yeah, yeah. It's really cool. And I was really glad that we didn't crash this one while we were filming. Mm, that's <laughs> That's good. I'm yeah. sorry, Liam. Yeah. <laughs> like that, we did last time. Like we did last time. Um, but yeah, that bike was great. Um, honestly, I was like, wow, I'd, I would love to ride this, like ride this bike and have one of these at some point. Yeah. It's pretty cool. If I were <laughs> racing enduro, that would probably be my first bike choice. It would mm -hmm. be the Divic Claymore. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sick. I'd love to try one. But yeah, um, super stoked. I also thought it was going to climb like way worse, and I was like, "That's what everyone says about super that bike." Because yeah. it's a it's a big long travel enduro bike, yeah, um, with slack geo, like all all the right things, yeah. and it's high pivot. High and everyone pivot thinks it's going to climb yeah. bad, and they all go, "Oh wow, it climbs way better than yeah. I thought." Like, yeah, really well. Yeah, um, and traction on technical stuff. I was just like, "Whoa, mm -hmm. okay, yeah." Um, kind of totally uh, changed my mind on that. So it was sick. I really enjoyed that bike. Yeah, solid. Yeah, well. and will descend it obviously really well too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, better. yeah. It has this ability when descending to like kind of stay up in the travel enough to give you support, mm -hmm. um, but it still is obviously plush. Still, the rear wheel gets out of the way like a high pivot should, mm -hmm. and it holds its line through corners really well, which I've found on a few other high pivots I've ridden. And they like as the wheelbase grows, mm -hmm. it kind of wants to like stand you up in the corner. 
as like your rebound kind of comes back. Mm -hmm. And the Claymore didn't give me that feeling at all. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's a odd. that's a well optimized bike. Have you ridden a Claymore? Not extensively. Mm. Not enough to uh make many comments on it. Yeah. <laughs> while you guys well yeah. That's fair enough. Yeah. But that's what was you guys you guys did it did what you needed to do there. Yeah, we sure did. So And I'd do it again if I had to. That was good. In terms of long travel bikes, I'm still just riding that Banshee Titan. Oh I yeah. rode it yesterday. Woof. <laughs> Jeez, the where'd you go? Suspension. Or I just, the water I just tower. rode in Newbury, so I did just yeah. a big loop, like came down Dos Fianos and then rode Water Tower a couple laps and then back up. Nice. And I got a nail, a big rusty, <laughs> like f maybe four inch nail. <laughs> like from in, like 20 years ago? In, I think it was crazy. From 20 years ago in the side lug of the tire knob, but it didn't puncture the tire. It just How does that even happen? Straight through. Were you cornering? Or I don't know. Who knows? Right? I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, it was, just, it was somewhere. I, I basically just all of a sudden started hearing... And I was like, well, I got, I, d I thought it was just like a rock or a stick or something got stuck in the tire, but it didn't go away. So then I stop and I look, I'm like, oh, dude, wow. there's a nail right through the corner lug. That's insane. I, I think I was it was like, how good of luck. So unexplainably explainably placed that we should put a photo yeah. uh, in the YouTube video yeah. for people to see. Because it was like, Green Goblin. Yeah. Note you, to the Green Goblin. We're going to put Green that Goblin. in the YouTube video because it's like how – it looks like you literally just like shoved the nail through the lug. I know. It's, it's pretty funny. Like, it is what? pretty funny. How does that even happen? Yeah. So if you want to see that, uh, just go to the MTB Podcast YouTube channel because we put these podcasts in anywhere you listen to your podcast as well as YouTube. And you can watch us live talk to a camera, look, talking to these microphones while the camera's there. A lot of – you know you know what's funny is we did this and then we took it away and I was like, we'll bring back the videos. I was like. We brought him back. Okay. Well, I'll we'll bring him back. Yeah, I we listened know, to the people. I didn't know if people wanted to watch us <laughs> yeah. so much talking to the microphones, but you're handsome. We'll do it. <laughs> that was so. When it was it the last podcast? I said, uh, "Help us out on the YouTube channel yeah, by leave leaving a comment. comment. Just say, say something say, random. Yeah. Say like Jared's hair is cool. Yeah. And then and then Jared's like, man." I was reading the comments and all these people were saying my hair was really cool. And I was wondering why, why is this happening? And then I was like, oh, yeah, that's what you said at the end of the video. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, man, my hair actually isn't that awesome. <laughs> people are just being oh, nice. Man. People are just being really nice listening to what Jeff has to just say. Just following orders, yeah, helping yeah. us out by leaving a comment on the YouTube video. Yeah. That was pretty funny. So if you are watching, just leave a comment and be like, yeah, Bean say, is awesome. Say Liam's hair is really cool. Liam's hair is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's actually that's even more funny since Liam doesn't really have much hair. <laughs> it's <was> hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious, man. Oh, it's hilarious. Funnier than Bean. Oh man, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta start your own podcast about your cat. Yeah, and, uh, that'd be good. Oh, yeah, you should have Bean talk, it'll be really funny. Mm -hmm. It'd be like Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, but uh, All right. yeah, let's get back on topic. So back on mountain topic. bikers can hear something that matters. Yeah. Well, speaking of like long travel and drill bikes, maybe we go jump into why long and slacker isn't always better. Like in the case of the new Rebel Ranger. Yeah, I mean, I think this topic's been talked about a lot. Obviously, Pink Bike did the whole grim donut thing where they tried to push it as far as they possibly could uh, in terms of being long, low, and slack. And there is totally a limit. It also really depends on your use case and your preferences, and I don't know. It gets, gets a little complex, but I think one meaningful thing is that there's a lot of shorter travel bikes, i.e. 100, 100 to 120 mil, and a lot of people go, they want almost downhill geometry on them in terms mm -hmm. of like a downhill uh, reach and head angle, and it really doesn't make that much sense. Like, I think everyone's kind of tried that and then kind of realized like, I actually kind of doesn't make sense to do that yeah like those bikes are meant to be climbed you climb a lot on those bikes and it just handles a lot better like you just need more balanced and sensible geometry like your geometry needs to match the ratio of how often you're climbing versus descending um especially and and obviously a bike that's 120 or less you're climbing a bit more than you're climbing a bike that's 160 uh, again you, there's obviously exceptions and use cases but i think that it is interesting because you know there is we brought this up because because liam was all agitated about the comments on some people in the ranger like why didn't they make that thing slacker uh i mean i think some people probably said that about the sb120 or like any shorter travel 100 120 mil travel bike people why don't they make it slacker well, it doesn't actually doesn't make have to all be. that yeah, much just, sense. Just buy yeah. a bike with more travel. Yeah, if you want slacker. It's like, well, uh, how about we look it's different like, use I don't case know, a few a few well, years back? Like, okay, this is what like downhill bike geometry used to be a few years ago. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, it okay, was. And now this is a cross country bike geometry. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think it's like the old saying, right? You're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Like, yeah, 
Like, why do you want a 120 mil bike with such a slack head tube angle to do what? To bottom out your 120? Yeah. Every big hit you get, you know? Like, it's, yeah. it's not really the right tool for that. Yeah, the um, intentions don't match the geometry. Yeah, and case. then Jeff and I were talking about the evil following because when the that first v1 came out that really like dude that bike made waves i I think i think the two bikes that really made waves especially in the 29er world was the evil following and the specialized enduro when they first went 29 Mm -hmm. because those two bikes were the first two that really nailed the 29er geometry that went from oh 29er sucks you sit above the bike you know you can't handle it it's only for xc yeah and then these bikes came out and they're like like well these bikes actually shred and it was actually at the point where 29er like tires and rim technology wasn't actually up to spec of how hard you could push these bikes at the point. So, yeah. but looking at that, the Evil pushed the head tube angle bit. They dropped the BB, which really made you kind of sit in this 29er more mm-hmm. than bikes previous to that. Um, but now, if you look at the Evil following, it hasn't gone much longer or slacker than they did when that bike came out 2013, 2014. It was a while ago. Like that's. I mean, I, I got one and just fell in love. Yeah, like, it's almost. This is sick. Yeah, it's Bro, almost it's a so decade good. ago, and the Geo's barely changed on that bike at all. And so it doesn't um, really need to, and it really shouldn't. It doesn't need to. I, I yeah. don't think. Um, and they've gone a little bit longer on the reach and a little bit steeper on the seat tube angle, but head tube angle hasn't really gotten too much slacker. Um, I think that's a company that like knows where its limits are and each bike has its own purpose right like the evil following which is their shortest travel bike doesn't have the same head tube angle as their evil reckoning which is their longest travel 29er right and that's for a reason right yeah i think like you know there's something to be said about pushing the boundaries of geometry on like a downhill bike because i think we're still kind of like searching for the limit there like people are still going faster and faster like every year and they're pushing the boundaries of these bikes whereas like we kind of already know the limits of like a cross country or trail bike. Like you're not going to, you don't really want to like exceed that, you know? Yeah. Like if you look at world cup downhill races, like these guys are getting better and faster every year. But I actually think big travel monster enduro bikes are actually slacker than most world cup bikes. At really? this point. Yeah. Uh, most world cup bikes around like a 63, five to 62, five head tube angle. And uh, the transition spires like 62, five, it might even be slacker in a certain position. Yeah. I mean, um, that's absurd. And that bike you're supposed to pedal with. <laughs> Yeah, so. but I mean, I get that. That's like, you know, almost like a free ride-esque type bike, right? So you kind of have to match the intentions there too, where yeah. you're not really sure about like, you know, what you're getting yourself into. But yeah, I don't know. I Well, if to talk about it from a business perspective, brands that make bikes have to find some way to differentiate their different models. And if you're going to have a 115 mil travel bike, a 130 mil travel bike, a 160 mil travel bike, you have to find a way to reasonably differentiate those products. And the the fringe case, the edge cases the, are the riders that say, hey, I want the shorter travel 120 mil travel bike with this obscenely slack geo. Like that's a fringe. Yeah. So it's not that that's like, bad per se but that's just a fringe case so for these brands they're not they're not trying to necessarily make bikes for the fringe case they're trying to say well if you know 90 percent of people that buy 115 mil travel 120 mil travel bike you know use it for quite a bit of climbing quite a bit of fire roads quite a bit of you know descending like it's just a much more all-around bike and they want they want certain aspects of it to ride certain ways then they have to and it reasonably makes sense for them to make a geo a certain way um, cause it's just a different bike, right. right. And a different use case. So, so economically, they're not just going to, you know, make bikes for the 10% of people that want right. downhill head angles on yeah. short travel trail that bikes. Doesn't make like, business sense. It doesn't make any business sense at all. So yeah. and I they, think they have to do this. Um, yeah. And I mean, there's, I think there's some ways that these, these fringe riders who want this downhill geo on short travel trail bikes can give it a go and yeah. Yeah. sure you love it <laughs> you'll see what you're riding in three years <laughs> I, I think revel does that really well actually is makes bikes yeah for 90 percent of people and probably what more than 90 percent of people should be riding yeah. is a, mm. a bike with sensible geo in the travel range that it's specified for so like the revel ranger you know has good like dialed geo for its travel range and 90% of people that want a 115-mile travel bike should be on this Geo. Maybe even 95% of people. Yeah. You know? 
even with like the rail 29 i remember when that came out people were you know rebel was somewhat criticized for having too conservative of, of geometry and like you kind of said it's like well people are probably better off having that slightly more conservative geometry because you're realistically not riding like the steepest stuff in the world every ride you go unless you like live in yeah. squamish or yeah whatever yeah but, i mean a perfect example which i think is this is a pretty funny example but we've talked about our, our buddy fbi matt several times um <laughs> he he had he's gone through so many bikes but he has a real team, um right currently yeah currently so he had a rascal a revel <laughs> rascal then he really wanted to just like get an enduro bike and you know got he went way down the rabbit hole of reading the comments of these fringe case riders on <laughs> comment threads yeah unfortunately and, the fringe case writers tend to have the loudest voice yeah. and and he so of course he ends up buying a mondraker when i was like dude you just it's just not the bike for you like i know your skill level we've ridden plenty of times it's it's not it's not the bike that's going to work for you um they're f fantastic bikes but they're geo and and it's just not for you and he got it and it didn't work really he, he just couldn't make it work he hated it. he's was like foxy or yeah, 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 yeah. And then so he ended up selling it about, I don't know, three or four months later uh, and getting a Rail 2.9 and now he's in love and it like fits and it works. But yeah. but he also still, he has, he has, uh, which I heard about this and maybe maybe you've heard of this, Louis, in the camera industry, it's called gas gear acquisition yes. syndrome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you just yeah. get obsessed with buying new gear all the time. So yeah. even if he's happy with one bike, it's like, I got to get <laughs> I gotta get a different one. It's well, just, so, I mean, I this is pretty funny. Bikes I mean, are like the best girlfriend you can have. You, you, you fall in love with one, you ride it hard, you you know, you put it away. This is dangerous. You, you kind of get so. over it, and then you see a new shiny one that comes out, and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna get that one, and this other one's dead to me now. I'm gonna push it aside, you know. So that is kind of fun part about bikes, and you can try everything and try different types. And yeah. Maybe that short travel bike. But a super French case head tube angle does work best for you. Maybe that's what you like. But yeah. I think 95% of people probably should be on Sensible Geo. Yeah. And yeah. that's also why I love my Rail 29 is for all-around trail bike that I can take anywhere, like, in the world, dialed bike. Yeah. Like, yeah, totally. I can make it around switchbacks, which, you know, you yeah. can't if it's too long and too slack. Yeah. Like a 62 and a half degree. You can, like a sloppy pirate of a <laughs> super slack bike. <laughs> well, sloppy I'm, pirate. I'm not Jack Sparrow, although <laughs> I would like to be. Give me some rum. Oh, man. Yeah. Why is That's the rum gone? It's funny to think about. Where is the rum? Why is the rum gone? I think, well, to end this topic, I think it is important to just ride different bikes. Um, it's obviously hard to do, but if, if there's a way you can ride your friend's bikes or demo different bikes or go to cool bike festivals, such as Sedona Bike Festival or Outer Bike, yeah, um, there's a lot of them where you can just demo a bunch of different bikes. It's really important. Like if you're into this, you're an enthusiast, you're interested, you got to try different bikes. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the end all be all takeaway for this sort of it's thing. It's the spice of life variety. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some might call it the spice of life. Yeah, riding, Some riding different bike, bikes. Well, you go in your garage and like, oh, I'll take this one today, whatever. I didn't say just buy 50 bikes. I just yeah, no, you did. You bikes. said it. Ride them, yeah. <laughs> but you, if the spice of life for Jared well, is having 12 there. bikes in his garage. Okay, there's did, only six, and you did, half of them are... You know, no, never mind. What did you say, Liam? <laughs> he did buy 50 bikes, buy them from Worldwide, and we greatly appreciate you as a customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have some sort of royalty <laughs> program, or loyalty, royalty. <laughs> if you are loyal, royalty, you are royal. Royalty. <laughs> If you were a lawyer, you were a royal. Royal is pretty, that's pretty good. No, right? That's trademark. We should we look that up. We are going to trademark that. All right. Well, let's take a quick moment before listener questions. For an ad? An ad. Yay. <laughs> and now, a word from our sponsors. Yo, I'm Jay Money, the new apparel designer for Kettle Mountain. Jeff and the crew hired me to design new and innovative gear. My first product will be the steel wool bib that exfoliates your buttocks while you ride. It does require some manscaping before use, but I promise it will be worth it. It's also sustainably sourced from steel wool toilet paper. <laughs> if you actually want an incredible bib with a proper Italian-made chamois and three pockets that thousands of riders love, check out KettleMountain.com and use the code MTBPODCAST for 20% off. That is K-E-T-L-M-T-N dot com. And now, back to the show. This listener asks... I am in need of a new drug. Cryptotol, Argotol, Xyonotol, Continental Tires. What drug combination can you suggest for someone who hates any kind of leakage and rides some rough terrain in Moab in southern <laughs> Utah? And by leakage... Uh, yes, it doesn't say that. Did you... What? It does say that. It does say that. For someone who hates any kind of leakage, yeah, you think yeah, they yeah. mean like... Yeah, but he didn't, he didn't follow up with and by leakage. No, I am saying by leakage. I know, I just wanted to stop you. 
Oh. Do you mean like <laughs> air leakage, sealant? Like it's kind of the same thing. Like air and sealant all comes out at the same time. I guess so. But regardless, he needs some new tires. Continental tires. We've we keep talking about them. Yeah. And you were about to say we made a video. I know you were. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I should have said we should make a video. We, we are going to. We're make going a video. to. Okay. Well, Someday. News, news yeah. to me. Going to force your hand. Yeah. When uh, the time is right. I have been riding those tires. Yeah. When the time is right. Yes. Yeah, um, Continental has made three tire models that, man, they're just, we can't stop talking about them. They're good. They're on World Cup downhill podiums, which is the pinnacle of mountain bike tire testing. F1. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're they're just really good rubber and tread patterns, and it's really impressive yeah. stuff. It's, you have it's, the Zynatol. Zynatol? Is that what's on Zynatol. my Zynatol. I just keep, I can't for the life of me memorize all the names and the tread patterns. Like, one, the names are all too similar. Yeah. And the tread patterns are pretty close in appearance a bit, but it's just, I don't know, it's going to take me a while. Um, I I think Zynatols. Continental got so much good stuff right with these tires, and the names are just yeah. the only thing holding them back from being You could amazing. say they went a little flat. With the- <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, remember what Charlie told us, you know, our friend over at uh, Continental, Continental, he said Continental? they say Continental. Yes. So it makes more sense with the names. Something about the way German. Sorry, that was Continental more of a, a German. A Continental is a German. Continental. Company. He did say there was something to do with. The tall. Tall. Continental. Zina Tall. Yeah, like, tall. I, I don't know. I, if you're a German listener, uh, please send a message to us. What uh, do the names mean? Yeah, what do the names mean? I love what's if what's like mean the whole situation? They probably do mean nothing. If, if <laughs> there's sound- any German speakers out there that have any feedback on these names, we would love to hear it because we're all sitting here wondering what's going on. Regardless, the tires are really good. Uh, when it comes to which tread patterns make sense, Moab, well, we all rode Moab, and it's a lot of rocks. Yeah, a it's, lot of rocks. I think I described Moab to somebody of pile like giant rocks with piles of rocks on top of other smaller <laughs> rocks, and that's what you ride your your bike on. That sounds right. So, uh, Zynatol seems like it would make the most sense for a, Moab. To a me. Zynatol would be really good front and rear, especially for like summer conditions. Yeah, um, and really rocky terrain. Yeah, if, if you're riding some a few other stuff, you know, or even like the upper stuff on the What's it? The plunge? Whole enchilada. You know, whole whole enchilada. enchilada. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's dirt on that. There, there's some soil A lot there. of the lower part of if, Moab, Moab is just rocks, but yeah. you're right. The, the whole enchilada has got so I would, everything I in would enchilada. I would say Jeff's currently running Zynatol front and rear on his Banshee Titan. Um, I've been running the Cryptotol front in the front a lot. There's a Cryptotol front tread and a Cryptotol rear tread. So Cryptotol front in the front. Mm-hmm. And then the Zynatol in the rear has Ooh. been my kind of go-to combo. And I think that would also work really well in Moab in southern Utah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I have the Cryptotol front and Cryptotol rear. In the front SB- and the rear. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, on my Yeti SB140, that I ran that combo in Sedona, which I guess is also rocky. Yeah, very um, similar terrain. And it was great, given the dirt was like hero dirt in places. And, I mean, the conditions were pretty good. I mean... But yeah, everything everything probably would have gripped in that scenario. But I mean, they still they still worked great. Yeah, if you're looking to try out some new tires, or you just want to experiment, yeah, yeah, Continental these these three models. Wow, yeah, they're they're good. They're I, definitely worth trying. I think that the first the first new tires to really give Maxis a solid run for you know quality and and ride performance. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, well, there you go. Cool. Next question. Cool. Next question. Could the new SRAM transmission allow bike brands to further optimize bikes uh, in Princey suspension, kinematics, geo, etc. around this direct mount design? That is a I very mean, interesting question. I guess so. I just don't really know off the top of my head what they would really do. I don't – my my answer is I don't think they would do anything substantial. I think maybe it just would be small things. Yeah. Um, I I still think what would be substantial is removing all of the weight of this derailleur and cassette to the center and lower center yeah. of the bike, i.e. a gearbox. Yeah. Um, because if you ride a bike with a gearbox, I mean, the, sh- the shifting on any gearbox bike is not quite optimized correctly just yet. Uh 
But man, the weight is so good. Like yeah, having all of is. the weight right there at the bottom bracket makes the bike handle so much better. Mm-hmm. Not it makes only so much the, more logical the weight sense. moved, but you remove unsprung weight as right. well. So exactly, it's like a double yeah. whammy kind of. Yeah. Right. There's like several things that are significant that change yeah. the way the bike rides in a good way if they can move the entire transmission of the bike to where the bottom bracket and is. And actually make a transmission. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Trans- um, yeah, transmission. yeah, I don't know what they could do because like they kind of with the only thing that I saw as a little bit of a drawback with SRAM transmission is there's not really a way to adjust chainstay length via a dropout flip chip now because of the direct mount design on the frame. So that yeah. kind of went away a little bit, um, like couldn't Santa you, Cruz was doing stuff. But. Couldn't you sort of move it up, though? So imagine you have your transmission direct mount and then here, you know, say 20 millimeters in front of it where the seat stay and the chain stay connect. You bolt it the... Uh, well, kind of like the Banshee or the Crest line. Yeah. Which yeah, the tough. Crest line uses bolt-on dropouts on the, uh, the Crest line downhill bike, bolt-on dropouts which can be flopped between 29 and 27.5 to geocorrect them. Mm-hmm. And that also uses SRAM UDH. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's doable. It's doable, yeah. And and I believe on the Crestline 27.5, there is room to shorten up that chain stay a little bit. Um, so it could be done like that. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how else they'd really optimize it based on just the drivetrain. Yeah. I agree. I mean, so, aside from, like, just – eliminating cable ports and stuff like that. Yeah, like but that's simplifying manufacturing. Yeah, it's pretty minor. It's not really. I mean, I think the design. bigger optimization was just going one by all together and eliminating a yeah. front derailleur need, right? For sure. Like, yeah. Ge- geometry trains drastically with that, so. Yeah. Agreed. The next big frontier is gearboxes. Yeah. Hope so. That work exceptionally well. Yeah. yeah. Well, now they long time coming. SRAM transmission just made that bar of working exceptionally well even yeah. higher. Yeah. Because it does shift so damn well. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, it's kinda of worked better than that. Yep. Yeah, that's a tough one. All right. How about this one? What are some of the quote unquote bad habits that can be developed while riding clipless? I have one. Wait, uh, wait. Oh. Oh, oh. Another line. Are there bad habits that can develop when riding flats? <sighs> Two part question. Um well, I can say that there are some people out there that, you know, when they're bunny hopping, they don't bunny hop the proper way and they pull up on their pedals and they think that's how you can bunny hop when that's really like not how you're supposed to do it. Totally incorrect way to do that. Yeah. 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 You want to pull up your front. That's the absolute most common. I'd, I'd yeah. say that's probably the most yeah. common. Yeah. Um, with clipless pedals. Yeah. Um, um I don't know. I can't really think of anything else. Like I, th- I think you can also get in the trap of not weighting your heels, mm. um, and kind of relying on the the clips to hold you in place. Where like when you do ride flats, you do have to put a lot of emphasis mm-hmm. on weighting your heels, mm-hmm. um, as well as just the, kind of your your body balance on yeah. your, on your, your foot placement. Yeah, exactly yeah. on your feet and kind of where your weight is. So Definitely. I think that could be a, a bad habit from clipless. Yeah. Bad habits that can develop when riding flats. I don't know. Maybe. Don't know. Is there such thing as too many Sam Hill drifts? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Not, not Je- Jeff does it all the time and he rides clipless. So. I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of people ride clipless that still take their feet off in corners, yeah, myself included. I do so. the same thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say like bad habits. I mean, I'll say like my, my feet come off the pedals if I'm like getting used to them again. You know, if I'm like, if I'm switching back and forth from clips to flats, yeah. like mm-hmm. first couple of rides, I'm like, ah, my and, feet are coming and off. I think a lot of that's like the weight in your heels part, yeah. weight in your feet part, right? For sure. I always say I'm going to ride flats for like a good amount of the time, especially like off season, then I never do. But I think I'm going to this year. Yeah, nice. it. I think it is. the At the end of the day, the smartest thing to do is if you really care about it, is just try and do both. Because yeah. you ride clipless and you learn how to spin a perfect circle and put the correct amount of sort of muscle input and distribute muscle input across that whole 360 degree pedal stroke. And that's really good and important. And then you ride flats and you realize that like cornering and being comfortable on the bike and being able to throw your feet off when necessary, weighting your heels. Like, I don't know. It's good to just 
change it up. It's also good to just ride a single speed too, right? Riding mm. a single speed versus a geared yeah. bike can teach you a lot. In yeah. a rigid bike, you should everyone should also like <laughs> change. If you really care, ride clipless. Also ride flats sometimes. And if you really care, also ride a rigid single speed every now and then because yeah. then you pick lines differently. Um, or yeah, you, you just a hard you think about yeah like, hard yeah hardtail does a similar thing yeah, as a rigid yeah, yeah. it just helps tomorrow. you pick lines and learn how to you know understand the bike and the terrain and how to react to it in a yeah. different way so you don't get too used to one bike and one setup totally yeah. I was just gonna say the same thing about going and riding my my El Jefe and going back to my full suspension like I feel like I am working on my fundamentals more when I ride the hardtail like for sure and I go back and I can ride my full suspension even better mm-hmm. yep yeah well true that's all I got for that one what is one shop tool that you've had to buy the most often? Four mils. <laughs> <laughs> Four millimeter almonds. 100% true. More often uh, than T25s? Uh, I think, I don't know. That was just kind of a joke because, like, the four or the five mil always goes missing in the shop, right? Yeah, it's true. always the tool. Yeah, it's the like the most common it's tool. It's the 10 mil socket of the bike world. Right. Yeah, it just um, vanishes. I was going to say a tire lever. <laughs> Because yeah, well, before I got the Pedro's ones, I would break them all the time. Yeah, and like I mean, ever since I got the Pedro's ones, I haven't broken one. Pe- Pedro just has the monopoly on good Pedro tire levers. Like, dude, dude. Nobody ones, can dude. make a better tire lever. It's like, don't even it's try. Except for that like carbon Revel one. That one's cool. That one is it's pretty like twenty five dollars cool. or whatever. I don't know. I don't even yeah. know if they make them anymore. But I don't think they do. It's like kind uh, of a marketing ploy. But yeah, that Pedro's one is legit. Yeah, the really Pedro's did. are the best. Actually, the Kushcore one is. Oh yeah, super solid for doing Kushkor, but yeah, also more expensive. But yeah, really good. Yeah, um, and yeah, I don't know what other bike tool. Well, for a while, I think the tool that I kept having to buy the most was that Park Tool internal routing tools. Oh yeah, um, because you use them so much, and then you kind of wind them up, and you spin them, and you pull, yeah. and then they snap. Yeah, really? so or they kind of kink a little kink, here and yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. So that was before everything was tube and tube, and we were fishing stuff through. I just remember like Yeti four five, Yeti five five, like doing that all the time probably dude i was buying like oh and i'd only use one you buy a kit and it comes with three and i'd only use one of the three so i just kept like snapping the one every mm-hmm. time like <laughs> every six months just snap one Jeez. um but that's kind of gone with now too yeah thankfully yeah that's true i you mean think i of anything jeff that you have to buy a lot when you work on bike <laughs> uh for those that didn't catch that there must that be so was a things. derogatory subtle <laughs> insult <laughs> Because I don't a work on jab. because I a subtle jab because I don't work on bikes very much anymore. Uh, I've been humbling you. You've I been worked on, on bike. I worked on bikes a lot in my life, but then uh, then there came a time where it would just made a lot more sense for me to work on different things. Yeah, um, I have a lot of responsibilities and uh, uh, oh, important ooh, things to <laughs> <the responsibility. laughs> You know, just make sure we can all pay our mortgages and oh, buy yeah. food. That's just you know whatever. No big deal. Whatever. Uh, just that kind of stuff. <laughs> so you had, you had so, to delegate your bike work. Yeah, I had to delegate yeah. the bike work. Yeah. Um, so I don't work on bikes as often anymore. But I, I, I do have a comment still. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my comment, my comment is uh, j- just a thought because maybe they didn't mean this when they asked this question, or maybe they did. A lot of people in my life have bought kind of too cheap of tools. Mm -hmm. So low quality Allen wrenches, low quality various tools of any kind, uh, they just, they break, they strip, they bend, they don't work well. And then you feel like, oh, I got to keep buying all these new tools. It's Mm -hmm. like, well, you just like didn't buy a quality tool to begin with. And And actually going cheap on tools, yeah, going cheap on tools, especially Allen wrenches is going to actually damage your expensive bike part. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's not uh, worth it at all. Like so damages like, the yeah. expensive bolt you put it into, it wears out and ruins itself faster and yeah. yeah. Like a like, Harbor Freight Allen set. And yeah, yeah and those away. Harbor Freight Allen sets the, turn oh. into circles and no My yeah. favorite Allen sets are the Wera yeah. sets that we have on the site. Those oh. are those are choice. by far the best sharpest yeah. engagement. Like That's too like sharp a sometimes. Premium hex yeah. plus premium level. I like that. Yeah. Those, yeah. those have if, a really nice engagement. But it's kind of the same thing with the bike rack. Like if you have a three thousand dollar more bike and you are going to be tightening bolts, like spend yeah, totally. You know, yeah. forty dollars instead of twenty dollars for a nice set of Allen's. Yeah, like, it's not not going to break the bank. Buy a hitch rack instead of a trunk rack. That too. Yeah. We made a video on that. We did an old one. We did best ways to transport your bike. Yes, I just got a new tailgate pad. You got I the got half the, stack. I got the half stack yeah. half by Fox stack. in the Overlander color. In the Overlander Oof. color. You're an Overlander. Yeah, which now. which ended up looking a little bit more like skin. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think it looks good for what it's worth. Yeah, it looks yeah, all right. It does yeah. look good. I wish it was a little more brown, but, you know. Really? But it is convenient. I, I just, yeah, it's a different look, and then I only ever put one or two bikes on it, so it works out. There you go. I like that thing. Nice. All right, next question. Thoughts on the second-hand bike market currently? Mm. Yeah. Well, kind of rough, I guess. Well, yeah, it's, it's not great. Crazy days out there in the bike industry. Yeah. Um, I made an Ask Jeff Anything YouTube video, I don't know, a month or so ago, and I talked about the bike industry. It's in a bit of a it's in a bit of turmoil right now and a contraction. And the secondhand bike market is uh, kind of a glowing highlight of that because a whole bunch of people bought new bikes or just any bike throughout the should we call them the peak pandemic years? I don't. I don't know. Just you pandemic can just say years. last few pandemic years. Pandemic years, last few years. There you go. Yeah. And now they realize they're not riding them as often, so they just tossed them up for sale. And so the the used bike market is quite flooded, um, and that's uh, causing a turmoil for that market, for the new bike market, and that's yeah, the industry's in a yeah. bit of a. It's like a double edged sword because you have new bikes that are discounted. So people, like, why would you go buy a used bike? If you could buy a new bike that's discounted. Yeah, it's yeah. just adding to the uh, indecision that there already was. Is. Yeah. Because yep. you're like, oh, there's so many good used bikes. Oh, but there's so many good new bikes, 20% yeah. off. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's kind of tough. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's not great. Not great. But, you know, everybody's got to buy them eventually, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that was just overproduction of bikes and bike yeah. parts yeah. for a while because there was over forecasting. Check with us in fall. <laughs> yeah. Things should hopefully pan out by 2024. Speaking of which, you're looking for a used bike. We have a pink bike page. <laughs> <laughs> and we put all of our demo bikes on there. <laughs> um, that is actually true. Just for people that thought that might have been a joke. No, it's we, true. We have a pink bike page for each shop, right? So our yeah. California store, Nevada store, and Pennsylvania store yeah. all have a pink bike page where we monitor, like add stuff to the pink bike buy and sell. And we put our demo bikes on there, mm. uh, staff bikes, um, various random components that came back with a tiny scratch or a damaged box or stuff like that so yeah we also have on our website the mega deals collection which oh, isn't which isn't mega bikes deals. Mega deals. which isn't bikes but it is stuff that like if you're one of those yeah. deal hunter type of people yeah um, yeah it's there yeah or if you go to our demo bike program page you will see all the bikes and the ones that have links are for sale uh, oh i did not know that actually yeah yep, how's anyone supposed to know that what do you mean? Well, when, if you're just like, oh, I'm looking at demo bikes. So you like, oh, Jared's like, I'm marketing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I get all the money. <laughs> well, no, if you're just like on the page and you like see there's a link, then you can click it. I guess I could maybe write, hey, this one's for sale. Well, one of the one quick important thing to note, that, since we're on the topic of plugs, if we <laughs> us selling uh, used bikes, whether they're demo bikes or staff bikes, still come with the full warranty of that bike. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Whereas if you buy a bike from, you know, John Smith on Pink Bike. You ain't got no warranty. Mm-mm. So um, just something to note. You ain't got just something none. to note. All right, let's move on to the next question. Oh, I really like this one. What got you guys into mountain biking? Really, really great question. All right, in 30 seconds or less. Okay, go ahead. I'll go you first. Start. Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, I actually first uh, had a BMX bike, and I was riding motocross with my friends growing up. And one of my buddies got a Kona Sneaky Junior. That was probably the coolest thing ever. At nice. Those, were, Dude, those, those were so cool. I wanted so them cool. so bad. That like, was the peak of Kona. Full the Fox stinky, Factory yeah. 2004. <laughs> coolest bike I had ever seen. And then, uh-huh. uh, yeah, I got a mountain bike after that. I was probably like, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. Went to Mammoth and uh, <laughs> rode the park there for the first time. And, yeah, I was, I was hooked. So I've been shredding ever was, since. Shredding ever since. Well, you said 30 seconds or less. I think I nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my story is that, uh, yeah, I grew up riding BMX and motocross and I had a buddy of mine who him and his dad had mountain bikes. His dad was a mountain biker and he's like, Hey, we should go ride these. And I was like, yeah, it looks cool. looks like a dirt bike with no motor. So I rode it. I think I was 13 and I rode them and I was hooked. I was like, that was the funnest thing ever. It's like this awesome combination. And then just got way into the sport and loved it. So 13 years old, I got into it. What about you, Wills? Um, Grew up riding a lot of BMX bikes that kind of turned to dirt jumping and did like a dual slalom race, but then I like got out of it altogether for a while. And then uh, just kind of riding bikes, a shop in Ventura where I grew up uh, called Metal Mountain. The owner was like, hey, you are like pretty quick at bikes and you have bike handling skills. You should go do a mountain bike race. And he like gave me his bike and I went and did a mountain bike race and 
I was kind of hooked. So I did like a couple years of cross country racing. And then I realized that there's a lot more to mountain biking than racing in circles and spandex. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, start, just kind of branched out and rode all the, all the mountain bikes after that. All nice. the bikes. So yeah. Trevor, Trevor down at Metal Mountain definitely got me into riding mountain bikes. That's rad. Yeah. That's really cool of him to do that. Let you borrow the bike. Nice. All right. Read the next question, J-Rad. Next question. I was wondering if you could talk about your preferred bike storage methods. When you have them in your garages or in the shop, is it better to hang them on the wall via the front wheel, standing on the ground in a wheel saddle, or your personal methods you choose, the pros and cons? Um, I'll go first. At home, I have two bikes. Basically, um, I think it's a... Oh, my gosh. I'm forgetting the name. It's like a uh, clip. Oh, do you know what I'm talking about? The The thing that I... On the wall, like on you mount it to the wall, the wheel, like what we have here. For yeah, what but, we have here. No, but you, you, it still rests on the ground, the mm. back wheel, at the clug or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. You, you basically like almost pop a wheel on the bike, and then it goes vertically up against the wall, and it just grabs the tire. Um, I have two of those, and I have three hooks hanging, bikes hanging from the ceiling, and I think two, one or two on the ground. I have six bikes in my garage with in a two car garage, mm. okay. and two cars. I got your beat. Yeah, you do. But you have no cars in the garage. They don't fit. <laughs> um, yeah, Liam's, Liam's garage looks like a bike shop. It does look like a bike shop. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'd prefer to have all my bikes on the ground, but that doesn't make sense yeah. spatially. Right. So that would be my preferred method, just a little rack sliding the wheels on the ground. Um, but I have six bikes on the wall on the toe peak. I was just looking them up. Topi swing away racks or like yeah, hooks. That sounds right. Yeah, like we have them here at the shop too. You like hook the front wheel and then you can actually like rotate. Pits. Yeah, mm-hmm. like rotate the bike closer to the wall. So like it's just the handlebar width sticking out. Mm-hmm. So I have six of those on the wall, mm-hmm. two up top. So I have eight on the wall total. And then I think usually three or four bikes in a, like a just a normal wheel rack. So that's not all mine. <laughs> Let me say <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> my roommate, my roommate also has six bikes and I have six bikes. So there's like 12 in the garage. Yeah. A lot of bikes. A lot of bikes, mate. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in a perfect world, bike storage on the ground is great. It's convenient. It's easy and makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have hooks in my garage. Well, not at the moment because I just moved, but prior to moving, I had hooks in my garage. I would just hang them on the front of the rear wheel. And that was like sort of the longer term storage. But the bikes that I rode often, I just leaned against the wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, just left them on the ground, yeah. put against the wall. It's easy. And if you have space for it, that's what I did. So, yeah. And yeah. pros and cons, I mean, for me, like, I haven't had any problems having my bikes vertical. I know some people have problems with like their brakes, you know, getting air bubbles in them or whatever. But if I've, your brakes are yeah. incorrectly bled, right. if you're, and you put the bike vertically, yeah. then you will now know that your brakes are incorrectly <laughs> bled. You'll yeah. be exposed. Or, you will be exposed. Or if your <laughs> suspension seals are dry and rotting, they might start leaking uh, more. That makes because sense. Because they're on the wall. For sure. Um, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I have six bikes hung, hung on the wall. There's no issues ever from yeah. hanging them. So For sure. That's kind of, a, kind of a myth. Yeah, for sure. Well, I guess not myth, but like maintenance yeah. your bikes, man. Yeah. Yeah. How about this one? I was curious if you could compare the feeling of CBF suspension going downhill to riding another non CBF bike with an O chain. Is it similar due to the lack of chain growth through travel with CBF? Also, I would love to hear more stories of being the cat. And before you say anything, Jeff, I did not add the last part. I swear I did not. I will show you. Well, you still put this question in here because of that. No, I did not. I thought it was a good fundamental question. People are figuring out how to get their questions prioritized. And this is not the first this <laughs> is not the first request cow. I have had for more bean content. Oh, now that man. is a lie. No, it's not. So that is also not a lie. Um I don't know. I don't really know fully how to answer this because uh, there's so many it's there's so, so many different bikes. Yeah, it's so hard to like just compare one to the other. Um CBF does feel really good all around. CBF is what Revel uses for their suspension design as well as Canfield bikes. Um, that being said, like, I don't know. It's really hard to measure kickback on bikes, which is what the O-chain slightly eliminates. Right. So it's hard to measure that on a CBF. And CBF doesn't exactly eliminate, like, chain growth, does it? I mean, it, it doesn't have a very far rearward axle path or forward axle path, which does have 
low amounts of chain growth. Right. But, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to like answer that fully. Um, I don't know. It's an entire podcast. It is an entire podcast. And I, and you have to do so much testing, like the same trail with, with CBF, with a chain CBF, without a chain of similar ish bike that might have a little bit more chain growth with O chain. And then that bike without O chain, like it's, yeah. Where, yeah. It's a little bit splitting hairs. It's definitely and splitting hairs. If you're, you know, at the peak of your game as a racer, you should be splitting hairs. Um, however, whoever ans- asked this question, I would say if you're interested in this topic, uh, some resources. So one, Nico Malali, who's a professional World Cup downhill racer that we sponsor, he wrote a really in-depth review and just like a I don't know, opinion piece and article on O-Chain. Uh, he was also on our podcast and we talked all about high pivot bikes and chain growth and suspension kinematics. Um, those two things. So if you just go to the World Wide Cycler site and, and uh, type in Nico podcast, maybe. Um, I'm trying to think how we can. Yeah, well, or you can. Um, use the Google machine. You can go to any MTV podcast. And if you click on the photo in the blog that is just of us, it will take you to all of the empty podcast episodes. Yeah. And the one Nico was on and then the article he wrote about O-Chain, um, I would tell you to look at those. And I would also tell you to look at, um, we made a video all about CBF in particular, because it is a pretty incredible suspension platform. Mm -hmm. And we made a YouTube video all about it uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And we had, you know, we had Chris Canfield himself who designed it, as well as one of the original engineers at Revel who sort of brought it to life along with Chris Canfield and the Revel guys. So I would just look at all those pieces of content and you can like really get into the weeds on this stuff because mm-hmm. um, it is a little bit splitting hairs, but it is really good, interesting stuff if you're interested in splitting hairs and yeah. learning more about suspension kinematics. Would you say so. there'd be a bigger difference, um, like not considering the O-chain and braking forces? between like a CBF bike and a non-CBF bike, like brake jack or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, CBF also has very low, to ma- low amounts of uh, anti-rise, which is brake jack or brake, you know, interference mm-hmm. with the suspension. Um, and that also has a lot to do with the, you know, kind of more up and down uh, wheel path versus going backwards or forwards because with going backwards or forwards and then braking, you're actually locking your suspension in kind of that zone. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. And one quick intermission before the last question, because <sighs> I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Ooh. All right. This question would be considered least but not last. Least but not last. For all the people that have trucks like the Tacoma, how many do you think still use a platform bike rack versus a tailgate pad? What are the advantages Slash disadvantages. Would you be shunned for using a platform rack on a truck? Whew. Well, there are definitely some pros and cons. Um, if you are someone, I think, who likes to camp in the back of your truck, a platform rack is the best way to go because you don't want to have to like mess with your bikes all the time. Yeah, I, I pretty much have n- never seen a truck with a platform rack unless there's other stuff in the truck. Yeah. So like, like if, yeah. if you have a camper shell on there, yeah. if you're putting a whole ton of luggage in there and then yeah. you put your bikes on the, on the, uh, tail on the, uh, tow hitch rack, hitch rack, hitch rack. The That's other one, but, but yeah, is tailgate pads are just so convenient. They're they so are. convenient. Like, like the easiest possible yeah. way. Cheap. Oh yeah. And they're cheap. They're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, super cheap. You take your bike, you go, put it on there. Yep. You're done. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Um, I was going to say the only reason why you would run a platform rack versus, Tailgate pad would I'd say would be like a gravel bike, um, oh, that's or true. or road bike like yeah kind of better fitted yeah those on don't that. work all that well on yeah. tailgate and then pads. sometimes the carbons like maybe just not inf- reinforced enough to yeah. take that yeah you know? mountain bikes are all good over on a proper tailgate pad but yeah that's yeah, fair road yeah. gravel drop bar bikes yeah or if you're just carrying any yeah like a diverse array of bikes right like you don't necessarily a city like, bike a commuter right. bike like yeah. I have a North Shore rack um, that I'd never use because. You can't really put a road. Well, you, now you can. They made like an adapter for road bikes, but for the longest time, you yeah. couldn't put a road bike on a North Shore rack. So, I mean, I get that. That's why I use the Kuat rack for that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, advantages, disadvantages. Like you have little things sticking out of your truck. I mean, it's about it. I don't know. Advantages, you can still use your bed for all that stuff. Like if you're traveling, 
you're going on a yeah, trip yeah, you and don't you take need, up any bed space. if you need to use your bed, like, mm-hmm. yeah, if you, and you're going with some buddies and you have four bikes, like it'll, you know, realize it takes up your whole truck bed. I mean, yeah, you know? going to, it does going to Sedona. We had three bikes, four people yeah. and we were stuffed in Jeff's truck in a Tacoma. Yeah. What do you have? Five foot bed? I think it's a five foot bed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, it's a short bed. Yeah. We were stuffed like any more bags or anything we would have been like yeah. looking for space. Four so. people in a Tacoma and four bikes. Um, on a road trip, that's about as much as you can go yeah. with a tailgate pad. Yeah, um, yeah, you're like then you're you're sliding all of your luggage in between the bikes and the bed, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good so. thing three of the four of us were like probably smaller than average humans. <laughs> and Jared, Jared being <laughs> an average exception. human, small for the average American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess the the exception would be like if you had one of those roof racks on your truck, like above the cab, then you could probably fit more luggage and stuff there. Mm. But like that's not ideal. Yeah. At all. No, yeah. Roof racks are just an asshole. They're probably better off just getting a just like high a up, track. cumbersome to put your bike on and off. No, I'm talking about for luggage. Like oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, overland, bro? Overland, bro? Bro, do you overland? Yeah. Bro, do you overland? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, I think, yeah, in that case, you're probably just better off getting a hit track and then, you know, whatever else you want. Yeah. Like my buddy has a, one of those shot, the soft top uh, things for Honest Tacoma. Mm. And like he has a tailgate pad. And yeah, it's a pain to get bikes in and out of there. Yeah. Like, yeah, if, if you're going to put a camper shell on your truck, then just, yeah, that, yeah. that's when you get a hit track. Yeah. And you just toss a tailgate pad. Yeah. Agreed. There you go. Mm-hmm. Well, that's it. That's all for episode 110 of the Mountain Bike Podcast. Thank you very much. If you've made it this far, please leave a comment and say, Liam's hair is looking super long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, what what was our, what was the other thing? What were you going to comment about the review? <laughs> yeah, the review. Oh, you're going to tell them to leave a review. Yeah, you can leave a review, screenshot it, uh, you know, send it to podcast at worldwidecyclery.com and we'll give you a $15 gift card code, discount code, whatever you want for the Worldwide Cyclery website. Also, uh, somebody left a review for the podcast, got the $15 code and used it to buy a Forestall, which was like a $14,000 e-bike. No so, way. Yeah. You didn't Seriously? Hear that? Isn't that funny? They used a fifteen dollar code $15 on that bike. Fifteen dollar code on a. On a <laughs> no way. But I just the, thought it was ironic. Think, it was just like funny. I think it's the like bigger a, story here 15 is fifteen bucks off this fourteen thousand dollar bike. <laughs> it was I, just, I thought it was funny. I think the bigger story here is that uh, discounts are allowed on those bikes. Yeah, yeah. If you can sneak one in there, yeah, <laughs> you, you can find have that many of those. You can sneak one in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Share it with a friend if you liked it. Thanks yeah. for watching. If you watched, thank you very much. Talk to you guys next time. Love you. Cheerio. Cheerio.